are incredibly blessed this morning to have our friends William and Chantel Wood with us. Uh, William and Chantel are part of the Global Awakening team uh, and uh, have been ministering to us all through uh, this week, Thursday, all day Friday, uh, all day yesterday. Uh, William originally comes from Alabama. You'll, when he starts talking, you'll realize he's not from the Bronx. Uh, originally comes from Alabama. He pastored there in Alabama for eight years. And uh, while he was pastoring, took a little church that started with 40 people and grew uh, quickly to 300 people. The Lord gave him a uh, strategy for outreach and ministry. Uh, Chantel is from uh, California, was raised in California. She's a graduate from the LA Dream Center, our friend Matthew Barnett. And uh, William and Chantel are both graduates from the School of Ministry uh, at Global Awakening. And now they travel full time with Randy. And Williams really is Randy's uh, right hand man right now, uh, right by his side all the time. And, uh, you know, when my wife really likes preaching, uh, she has a word. She says it's kaboom. And uh, so I was uh, doing some other ministry yesterday morning. And while William was preaching here yesterday morning, uh, Denise texted me and she said, now it took me 15 years to get a kaboom from my wife, all right, for my preaching. And uh, while, while William was preaching, I got a kaboom on the phone. So I, I want you to get ready because you're going about to receive a kaboom this morning, all right? Would you please get on your feet, give a warm welcome to our friend William Wood. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. Let's give Jesus praise. Jesus, Jesus, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Yes, God. Y'all may be seated. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't realize people got up this early to go to church. <laughs> So you must be the morning crowd, right? Yes. Well, I, I have bad news for you. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> so I really don't know if I'm going to be able to preach this morning, so I may just talk. <sighs> My wife, on the other hand, she is a morning person, per person and she, wanted, she is one of these people that has a dream every single night. Do, we have, do I have dreamers in the room this morning? Like, I do not dream at all, but my wife dreams every night. And every morning, the first thing she says to, his, to me, William, I had a dream. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I have to be awake for at least an hour before I even realize I'm saved. <laughs> right? And I'm like, babe, just please, get at least an hour here. So I'm warning you right now. I've only been awake for about 45 minutes. <laughs> so I don't even know if these next 15 minutes will be sanctified or not. So I'm completely depending on the Lord to help me out right now. <laughs> but now, uh, me and Pastor, uh, me and Dr. Randy Clark and the team, we've had such a wonderful time over the past couple of days. As a matter of fact, we've, we have seen over the past couple of days, 147 healings take place. Come on. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Matter of fact, if you're here this morning, if you've been healed over the past couple of days, just raise your hand at me. I just want to see it. Wow. Look, everyone look around. Come on. Isn't that amazing? Jesus. Jesus. How, how many of you were healed of multiple things? Come on. All right. Jesus. I must know God is a healing God. That he is a good God. He is a loving God. And I believe he's here to bless us in a special way this morning. But I feel like I have a message that I want to take us back onto memory lane this morning. So I, it's going to require from you some engagement in what I'm talking about. And I like to talk with my audience, not at my audience. I like to talk with the people, not to the people. So I always invite the people to go on a journey with me when I begin to minister, when I begin to speak. And I would like to share a message with you this morning of titled Childlike Faith. Now, just with that theme, just with that topic of itself, it's going to require of you to go back in memory lane to when you were a child. 
because I feel like there are significant things that when we were a child in our thinking process that's significant now for our walk and journey with Christ and our following of Christ. A matter of fact, when the Lord first began to speak to me on this subject of following him, following him with childlikeness, he actually took me back to when I was a five-year-old kid. And you know, do you remember when you were a kid, you, you had a, your favorite superhero or something like that? Anybody can relate to that? Okay, nobody in the room. Okay. <laughs> Well, if you're a lady, you probably were a princess or something, you know, or Wonder Woman. I don't know. Come on. We just had a Wonder Woman movie come out. I did go and see it. I know. I like chick flicks as well. And it was a great movie. But the Lord took me back when I was five five years old, and my favorite superheroes when I was five was the Ninja Turtles. You know. See, I grew up, I'm a 90s kid. I grew up in the 90s. And the Ninja Turtles during the 90s were like, they were it. And I remember, I believe so much that I was a Ninja Turtle. I remember my mom literally sitting me down trying to convince me that I was not a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> I mean, it got to, it was, so, it was so bad. I would even go to school and I would take my little Ninja Turtle outfit to school. And I would get in trouble at school because I had me and, and a couple other of my friends, we thought we were Ninja Turtles. So we, we would go around actually thinking we were fighting the bad kids, not realizing we were the bad kids, you know. <laughs> like we were the ones starting all the trouble, but we felt like we were going around like we, we created these things in our mind at school. <laughs> I do not suggest children do not do this. <laughs> I, think, I think they all went to children's church anyway. But do you remember being that child, being Batman or Superman or Wonder Woman or whoever you were? Like, I remember as well, I love Superman as well. I remember getting on the porch, putting my little cape on, and thinking that I could actually fly. I remember just diving off the porch, bam, <laughs> you know, hit the ground thinking I can fly, you know. But I even remember going to the grocery store with my mom, and every time I would see a A manhole, you know the manholes that you see out on the road? I would always run to this manhole and try to pull the manhole up because that's where the Ninja Turtles live, right? They lived in the sewers. And so, and my mom would always come to me, William, William, no, there's no Ninja Turtle down there. And she would try so, so hard to convince me that I was not a Ninja Turtle. And I was always like, well, get behind me, thee Satan. (laughs) No, I'm playing. I didn't say that to my mom. Come on now. But what if we followed Christ with the same heart and same attitude? What if you follow Jesus in a way that there's nothing someone can say, there's nothing someone can do to change your mind about following him? Do you remember when you were a child, you would create these these dreams in your mind and you begin to play those things out, right? Right? How, as something that happens to us as we begin to mature and grow, that somewhere along the way, we, we stop dreaming with God. We stop dreaming. And what I feel like the Lord wants to do this morning is that he wants to restore to us our imagination. He wants to restore to us our ability to, to dream with him. A matter of fact, Jesus thinks it's this important. To become like a child. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, it says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, come on now, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom. Now, that's a very significant statement, would you say? I would like to make a point right here where it says, if you do not become like a child or children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if it's significant to become like a child to enter the kingdom, don't you think it will be significant to remain as a child to experience the kingdom? Some of us have become too mature to experience God. 
There's a difference between, between being childish and childlike. We are to, to leave behind the childish things. But as we grow and mature in God, we are to always remain childlike. And if, and if it's significant to enter the kingdom as a child, then I believe it's significant to remain as a child to explore the reality of his kingdom. And for some of us in here this morning, you probably have been stuck in your journey, in, uh, journey with God simply because you've entered the kingdom and then stopped dreaming. You've entered the kingdom and then came to church, and church and religion has beat dreaming out of you. Oh, boy. <laughs> Jesus wants to take us on this journey with him because Jesus is fun. Jesus is exciting. Jesus likes to come to, he still views you as that little boy. He still views you as that little girl. And guess what he likes to do with children? He likes to play with children. He likes to explore with kids. He likes to say, come with me on this journey. And let's explore my kingdom together. You see, I feel like God wants to restore this child likeness this morning, and he also wants to restore the joy of walking with him. Yes. Yes. A matter of fact, I want us to look at several different stories in the Gospels this morning of how Jesus constantly put the disciples in situations that required them to become like a child to follow. How many of us know God will, all, will often put you in situations <laughs> that will require you to depend on him. Yes. But remaining as a child would determine if you will follow in those moments or not. And the first story that I would like to look at this morning is found in the book of Luke, chapter 5. In this story... The disciples have been going out and they've been fishing all night long and they have caught nothing. Now, for a profession, they are fishermen. So let me ask you this. Do you think they would have an expert opinion on fishing since their profession is fishing? Now, we could probably all say that Jesus probably more likely was a carpenter, correct? So who do you think would have a better opinion about fishing? The the disciples, the fishermen, or the carpenter? We would think the fishermen, right? And so we pick this story up in Luke 5, verse 5, where Jesus is telling them, let's go back out into the water. You've been tolling all night long, even you caught nothing, nothing, but let's go back out and go fishing. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But I would do as you say. <laughs> no, he didn't say it quite like that. But in my mind, I'm, I'm reading it that way. I'm reading it how I would respond if I was a fisherman and I know how to fish. Are you following me? I would respond to Jesus. Listen, I, I, I know what I'm doing, Jesus. I know where to go. I know how to fish. And I have already explained to you, Jesus, that there's, I can't, there's, we haven't caught anything. How many times do we approach God that way? How many times do we become such an expert in our understanding that we stop listening to the voice of God? What happens to us as Christians oftentimes is we begin to mature and grow in God. We would get to a certain level of understanding and we begin to lean more on the understanding we've arrived to rather than the voice of God that's, that's been speaking to us. For some of us in here this morning, the voice you're hearing is the voice of your understanding and not the voice of your father. Any truth you think you know, that truth can no longer teach you. Let me say it a different way. Any truth you think you have the full understanding of, that truth can no longer teach you because you think you have full understanding of it. In other words, you've stopped your ability to have progressive revelation. 
And for some of us in here right now, we've grown to a certain level of truth, a certain level of understanding, but we've kept off our ability to grow because we've leaned more on the understanding than we have the voice. Let's see what Jesus tells the disciples. When they had done this, I think I just accidentally skipped out some scriptures there on my iPad. I actually didn't accidentally left some verses out. Is it here? But I would do as you say. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish. In other words, they go back out and start fishing. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the, in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of their boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet. What would you do? Going away from me, Lord, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, for amazement has seized him and all his companions because of the great catch of fish which they had taken. Wow. And so we see here, Jesus puts the disciples in a moment where they have to sacrifice their knowledge. They have to sacrifice their understanding in order to follow him. Listen, God will oftentimes speak to you beyond your level of understanding because he wants you to grow. And if you put God inside of the, inside of the box called logic, you'll stop hearing his voice. Listen, the most logical thing for you to do is to think from God's perspective. <sighs> That's the most logical thing for you to do is to think from God's perspective. And, what, and for me, I know it's time for me to grow when God starts speaking to me outside of my ability to understand. I know in that moment right there, he's challenging me to follow him as a child. But if I have become so secure in what I know, I'll stop following him and what he says. I may start preaching now. I don't know. Do you know what the Lord did with me when I first started walking with him that really began to break this in me? One day I was driving on an interstate, and I'm just going to forewarn you. Some of these stories that I'm going to share may be a little unusual. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask you to bear with me and think like a child because my heart is always to follow Jesus. But I was driving along the interstate going, going home um, one night. You know, and we all obey the laws of the land. So I was driving, I don't know, 100. <laughs> I was trying to get home, you know. But as I'm driving on the interstate, my head, the headlights on my car go out. Just, just stop working. Would you freak out in that moment? I mean, in that moment, I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do? I'm going 100. I'm going to die. And so, and so, and they were not turned back on. So I eventually get off on the side of the road, and I get out. And, you know, I get out of the car, I open the hood, and I look under the hood, you know, and it's like all men do, act like I know what I'm looking at. And <laughs> come on, man, we know this. <laughs> I'm like checking the oil. Yeah, the headlights look good. <laughs> man, we know this. Then we get back in the car and say, babe, you know, everything's fine. And we act like we really knew what we were doing, right? Well, I open the hood. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm checking everything. I, I, you know, everything looks fine to me. And then the Lord says, I want you to lay your hands on the headlights and pray. I'm like, then I start arguing with God. I said, God, you, I know you heal people, but you do not heal headlights. Come on. Come on, God. Get with it. Get with the program, Jesus. And I, 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 and I began this argument with Jesus right there in the middle of the, on the side of the road. And he's like, William, just lay your hands on the headlights and begin to pray for healing. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Let me ask you, in that moment, what would you do? Would you sacrifice his voice over your understanding? Or would you lay your hands on them, those headlights? Put yourself in that situation. What would you do? Because, because that may reveal where you are. 
And so then I stepped back and I looked at the headlights. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> you know? And I just started going. I didn't know, know what to pray. So I know my prayer language knows, right? <laughs> God knows how to pray. <laughs> and so I just started praying. And in about 30 seconds, the headlights turned back on. It never goes up. Never had any issue with the headlights ever again. But it was all because I sacrificed my understanding. I sacrificed my human logic to hear his voice. I sacrificed that because I know that he is a, he's a higher being than the words that he speaks creates life. And so then I lay my hands on it. The headlights come on. And that's when the Lord spoke to me. He says, William, the most logical thing for you to do is to think from my perspective. And that moment right there is what started the journey of me following him like a child. It opened my mind up. It opened my imagination up again to explore him. To hear him in any way that he wants to speak to to me. Listen, when you limit how you hear, you limit what you hear. Some of us have put God inside of this box, and that's the only way that he can speak to us is through this one avenue. It may be the Bible. It may be through people. Whatever that avenue may be. But when God begins to speak to you outside of that context, you don't hear his voice, so you think he's being silent. I would like to suggest to you that if you are in a place with God where it appears that he is silent, it's just because he's speaking to you outside of the context of what you're used to hearing him. It's actually a sign for you to grow. It's actually a sign for you to become like a child and say, I'm searching out the voice of my father. After this incident with the headlights, I go home and my, God opened me up to a whole new understanding of healing ministry. I'm like, man, I could start an appliance healing service. I mean, I'm serious. I started doing this. I'm, I'm laying hand on refrigerators, you know. Be healed. You have a washing machine that needs healing? I mean, literally, I, would, I went home, and I started sitting in my house waiting for my light bulbs to blow. Because I wanted to see God to turn the lights on, you know, with no electricity or anything. So God just, <laughs> I'm just being funny, but I, I did do that, actually. So I, I can't lie in church. I did do that. But God just opens me up to this whole new place of hearing him. And about three or four weeks after this incident with the car, I'm walking around in in the business that I worked in at the time. It was a chemical company. We made cleaning products. And I was out in the back one one day, and I was cleaning, uh, cleaning the different pails and buckets that we have that we make product in. And there was a cricket in the in a water pail, and it was and it was dead. And I feel like I hear God say, raise the cricket from the dead. (laughs) <laughs> I told you some of these stories are a little unusual. Become like a child. Become like a child. Help, please become like a child. And, this. and I'm like, what? You raised a cricket from the dead. I said, well, okay, if you want me to do that, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure this cricket is dead. I'm going to give it about three days. I'm going to leave this pill on. I'm going to make sure this cricket's dead. And so, sure enough, Three days later, the day of resurrection, (laughs) right? (laughs) And at this point, my the the manager of the of the business has become used to me because I I prayed for everybody that came in the business. You know, a lot of people got healed and saved, delivered at the chemical company. So he was used to me doing some unusual things. And to be honest with you, I was at that time I was not really a good employee. So what I'm trying to tell you, I was very young in my walk with God. I needed to honor the business, right? But, and so I should have did this on my break, not during work. (laughs) That's what I should have done, just to preference this. And so after the third day, I go back, and there's the cricket. He's he's still dead. I know he's dead now. It's been three days. Okay, so I get the cricket out of the water, and I put the cricket on this concrete, and I start praying over the cricket. Come up! Get up, rise, rise. I just start declaring life over the cricket. And sure enough, I mean, I get down on all fours. I'm, not, I'm like this. Get up, little buddy. Get up. Bring get life. And then my manager walks out and says, uh, uh, 
what are you doing, will you? I said, uh, I'm raising a cricket from the dead. <laughs> he just drops his head. He said, okay. Raising a cricket from the dead. And I sat there speaking life into this cricket for like 35, 40 minutes, you know. And after about 40 minutes, this cricket literally flips over and walks off. And then I'm like, oh, my God, my first resurrection. I raised a cricket from the dead. (laughs) Would you have done that? Are you willing to dream with God in such a way that you'll look foolish to people? If you're not willing to look foolish before man, then you're not willing to follow Christ. Because sometimes God is going to ask you and he's going to put you in situations where it's not going to make sense to the, to the carnal mind. It's not going to make sense to your friends at work. It's not going to make sense to all your buddies or whatever. But God is calling you to do something that's significant. But if you are, if you are refined by the fear of man or by your human logic, listen, you will stop following Christ after salvation. Wow. Do you get what I just said? Oftentimes, we don't care what people think to come to the altar. But it stops at salvation for us many times because we don't want to do what he says in the streets. And all of a sudden, the fear of man becomes the voice in which we listen to. Listen. When your love for God grows greater than your fear of man, you'll begin to step out and listen. Let's look at another story. In Mark chapter 6, there's a story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is one of my favorite stories here. And to let you know how I read the Bible is that when I read these passages of Scripture, I put myself in the scene itself. I put myself in the story and I ask and challenge myself, how am I going to respond? Because that's going to reveal to me where I am in this journey. And that's how I I receive from the Lord many times through Scriptures. I inject myself into the scene. As as if I am the disciple. And so Jesus here feeds the 5,000. The disciples, they have been going all all day long. They haven't had anything to eat. I don't know about you, but my love language is food. (laughs) The first time I fasted, I I almost killed my pastor. (laughs) I'm joking there. But let me ask you this. When you fast, after a couple of days or after a day when you're really, really hungry, are you a little bit irritable? Husbands and wives, I'm sure you know this. Well, these people have been going all day long without something to eat, and I feel like, I just feel a sense that they're just a little bit hungry, and that's what I feel the sense that they're just a little bit irritable right in this moment. And so Jesus looks to the disciples, the disciples come to Jesus, I mean, and they begin to say, hey, we need to give them something to eat, Jesus. What are you, what are you going to do? That's what the disciples are saying to Jesus. But Jesus gives this response to the disciples in Mark 6, verse 37. But he answered them and said, you give them something to eat. What would you do in that moment? What would you do if you were standing in front of 5,000 people? It's not even counting the women and children. It could be 10,000, 12,000. And Jesus looks at you. You have nothing in your hand. Jesus looks at you and says, you feed them. What would you do in that moment? Let's see what the disciples do here. 
And they said to him, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii and, and bread and give them something to eat? In other words, they immediately start looking at what, call, at what God called them to do through their own ability. I don't know, we just got that. Oftentimes when God speaks to you, you don't step out and go for it because you're looking at it through the lens of your ability to perform it. The reason I am so excited and I'm so filled with love and passion to follow Jesus because I live with this understanding it's outside of my ability to do. And so it constantly puts my heart and my mind in a place where I have to learn to yield to his ability to live through me. You see, living like Jesus has absolutely nothing to do with your ability, with your ability. It has everything to do with your willingness to yield to Jesus. To the degree you yield to Jesus is to the degree you live like Jesus. And so Jesus looks to the disciples and says, you give them something to eat. They said, are we to, are we to go and, and spend all our life savings? Listen, we're pastors. We're broke. I'm like, <laughs> are, are we to spend all of our money and buy some food and give it to them? Immediately, they start looking at what they are capable of doing. And Jesus this entire time is trying to train the disciples to get outside of their ability to perform and to step inside of his ability to perform. Let's move on here with the story. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? So we, in another passage, another uh, gospel, we see that a child comes with what? What does he come with? His lunch, yes. I like that. I'm going to use that. I just stole that. I'm not going to give you credit for it. <laughs> he comes. Go look. And they found out. They said, five, five loaves and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in, by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the fish among them all. They all ate, and they all were satisfied. Now we see one of the most remarkable miracles happen here. Right? But we tend to read this story. I don't know about you, but I tend to read this story as if Jesus takes what they have, he blesses it, and all of a sudden a buffet is manifested out in front of everyone. You see, I don't really think God put them in that situation quite like that. He looks at them. He says, what do you have? In other words, he says, bring to me what you have. All you have to do is just come to God the way that you are. He's not asking you for, to, to attain a bunch of things before you can come to him. He's asking you right now, come to him the way you are with what you already have in your hand. And so he takes what they already have. What does he do? He blesses it. He blesses it, and then he breaks it, which means he begins to multiply. If he takes the bread and breaks it initially, the breaking of that bread initially actually reduces it. Oh, boy. Actually makes it a little smaller, right? And then he... I believe he looks at the disciples and says, get the people to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And I, I don't feel like they were, they were not just sitting right here beside them. In other words, there was a walk that they had to go on to get to the group. And see, I believe Jesus takes the, the bread, he blesses it, and then he gives a little bitty piece of bread and a little bit of fish to one of the disciples in their hand. And then Jesus says, now turn to the crowd Mm. and go feed them. You see, when Jesus puts what he has blessed back, back in their hand, now they have to trust that what they, have been given, what they have been given is now blessed and has supernatural capabilities to provide. And so this right here, what you bring to God and he blesses and gives back to you, now you have to trust that what he's given to you has the ability to perform. And so what this requires of you in this moment is called trust. 
And all of a sudden, they begin this journey called trust and obedience. You know, I want you to even look at it this way. Jesus puts it in their hand and says, now I want you to turn to the crowd. I want you to turn to your fears. I want you to turn to the influence of man. I want you to turn to the circumstance. And I don't want you to run from it. I want you to run to it. The voice of God will always take you to your fear to triumph over it, not to be defeated by it. And so now they have, they're beginning to walk toward the group of people, and I am willing to bet they better say, you better have more in your hand than that little piece of bread when you get to me. <laughs> Come on now, they've been fasting. Ask my wife how I am after lunch of having eight. <laughs> Not good. Listen, I've read the, the, the book, The Five Love Languages. It's not right. There needs to be a sixth love language, and it's food. I mean, literally, sometimes when I'm preaching, I can, people's heads start turning into cheeseburgers and steaks. <laughs> the closer I get to lunch, the less sanctified I get when I, what I say. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm off. <laughs> Been around Dr. Randy too much now. And so now they're on this journey, and they're facing their fears. They're looking at the people that are taunting them. They're looking at the people saying, you better have something more than that. And, but when they, and I feel like with every step they take requires a greater level of trust and a greater level of obedience. Listen, you will never obey where you do not trust. The level of your trust determines the level of your obedience. And so they're on this journey toward the crowd, and with every step, they're having to rely on him more and more. And all of a sudden, I believe when they get to the crowd and they give the little piece of bread and fist that they have, I believe in that moment, all of a sudden, things, provision begins to come. Multiplica multiplication begins to happen. I believe it was in that moment right there that the miracle took place. It was the understanding that what I have been given is blessed of God. In other words, I have been given his ability to walk this out. Everything that God gives to you, he gives to you according to the measure of Jesus. God doesn't give you, you, you the ability to, to do something. He gives you his ability to do something. And so they get to the crowd and all of a sudden... Multiplication begins to happen, and over 5,000 people are all filled and all satisfied because they became like a child and trusted Jesus. Some of you in here right now have sacrificed miracles. Because you were afraid to follow as a child. Some of you in here right now waiting for the provision to come before you step out into your assignment. When God is waiting for you to realize what you have has been blessed so that when you step out in your assignment, provision can come. God, some of us are waiting for an anointing to, become, to come upon us before we begin to preach the gospel. But God is waiting for you to step out so the anointing can come for you to preach the gospel. When I gave my life to Jesus, I understood right then I was called to preach. And listen, I, if you heard my story over the weekend, you realize I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. I didn't have any significance in myself. I didn't have any value to me or my, my life. I thought I was an introvert. I didn't feel like my voice mattered. And when I came to Jesus, I immediately know he has called me whew, to proclaim his gospel. And I didn't, I didn't go home. I didn't wait for something to happen. I went home, and I, you know what I started doing? I started preaching to my walls. No one was listening but my walls. I started preaching in the mirror to myself. I started writing down sermons. I did this for six months. I started writing down sermons, preaching to the walls. And one day, my neighbor brings a, brings a housewarming gift over to me little girl she brings this little cat little kitten 
I'm not a cat person. I'm a dog person. But I just could not find it in myself to look at this little child <laughs> and say, I don't want the kid. I don't want the kitten. So I took the kitten in. But one of the strangest things happens is that as I would preach in the walls into the mirror, this kitten, it would come in and sit down and listen to me. <laughs> and I began to know, I'm beginning to notice, man, my cat's hearing the gospel. So I began to practice my altar call on the cat. Little kitten, do you, do you believe that Jesus is God, that he's Lord and Savior? Meow, if you believe that. Meow. <laughs> See, I'm getting a little weird for some of you right now, right? <laughs> and, and I would do this for six months because I didn't wait for an anointing to come for me to step out. I stepped out. And when, uh, when I, be- I developed messages for six months, and one day my pastor says, William, I want you to get up and preach. I said, okay. I've been doing this. For- I didn't tell him this. I've been doing this for six months to my cat. People are no problem now. I got cats responding to me. You know what I'm saying? And so I get up. I begin to preach. And my pastor's like, what in the world is happening right now? Because I, I, I just had one volume then. You know, I would just explode on everybody. I'm a little more refined now. I go, it's like a song now. I just go up and down and all around. <laughs> and so I just, be, I began to preach the gospel because he gave me an opportunity. And you know why the opportunity came for me to preach the gospel? is because I didn't wait. I didn't wait for the anointing to come for me to do something. I started doing something so that the anointing could come. I started doing something so that the provision would come. Some of you here this morning have calls on your life. That God is encouraging you this morning to step out. God is encouraging you this morning, go for it. He's saying, go for it, my son. Go for it, my daughter. I have blessed what you have. What I have given to you is supernatural capability. Some of you right now, the only thing that you needed to hear was permission to move. And listen, I'm telling you as a minister, I'm telling you, I feel like I'm hearing God saying this. He's given you permission to step out. He's given you permission to to go to the needy, to go to those places that you've been longing to go for. Listen, when you begin to understand that you are his response to the issues of the world, you begin to realize your significance in a greater way and realize I have been called. I have been equipped. I have been anointed. I... Have Jesus. <laughs> I have a friend, his name is Woody. <laughs> you ever, have you ever seen the movie Toy Story? Well, my friend looks just like Woody on Toy Story, <laughs> identical. I mean, he's all gangly and goofy, just like Woody on Toy Story. And and you know what the amazing thing is? I look like Buzz Lightyear. (laughs) You notice Buzz Lightyear? He's bald and everything. I'm bald and good looking, you know? (laughs) But one day, after this incident with the cat and everything, me me and my friend Woody are driving in the car, and I'm reading the Bible, and I come across this passage of Scripture And Romans chapter 8 says, for all of creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And I said, Woody. And Woody's one of these type friends that will do anything that you say. Like whatever pops in his mind, he will do it, right? We all have friends like that. I look at Woody and I said, Woody, all of creation is awaiting for us to, to be revealed. He says, what? I said, yeah. Before I realize it, because I lived in Alabama, there's dirt roads everywhere. Before I realize it, Woody is turning down this dirt road. I'm like, Woody, where are we going? He says, we're going to preach to the creation. (laughs) 
And he pulls out into the he pulls out into the middle of the woods, and we get out with our Bibles in our hands, and we say, "Birds and coyotes and squirrels, <laughs> come forth and hear the gospel." Why would we do something like that? Isn't that silly? But I think God enjoys your silliness. I think God enjoys when you do anything for him. I'm not sharing that story for you to look at me like I'm a crazy man. But I am being vulnerable with you sharing some of these stories. <laughs> Sometimes I don't really want to share, but the Lord puts on my heart to share. Because these are how, these stories, these things are how I learned to remain as a child. These are things that the way I learned to move with God. And so my encouragement to you is to remain as that child. Let God speak to you. Let God take you on a journey with him of exploring his kingdom. Would you like to hear one more story? Now, if you were not here over the weekend, I did preach for two and a half hours straight yesterday. And so I have at least 50 more points to go through. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. But I want to share with you this one more story. Matthew chapter 14. This is where the disciples are in a boat again. They're out in the water. And all of a sudden now, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And when he gets to the boat, let's see what the response of the disciples are in Matthew 25. I mean 14, verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And he said, it's a ghost. I kind of feel like he said, it's the Holy Ghost. Right? <laughs> and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Now, I put myself in this story and I'm imagining, I don't think Peter really thought that this ghost was going to tell him to come, right? And you realize what he's telling him, to, he's telling him to walk on this water to him. Right? What would you do in this moment if Jesus came to you walking on the water and he looks at you and says, come out on the water with me? You see, I even believe Peter probably tested the water. I would have. I was like, well, Jesus, this is not going to work. Look. <laughs> but, but testing the waters isn't an act of faith. It's an act of distrust. Oh, boy. Did you get that? I don't believe he was able to walk on the water until he decided in himself that the word he heard was a word he could trust. And once he settled in his heart that he can trust the word of Christ, mm, he stepped out and walked on water. But as the story continues, let's look at something here. But immediately Jesus spoke to him saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, it is you. Command me to come on, on the water. Okay, I already read that. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, listen to this, seeing the wind, in other words, seeing the circumstance, seeing the opposition, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt when, you got into the, when they got into the boat, when the wind stopped, and, the, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. And so now we see Peter walking on the water. In other words, he settles in his heart that he could trust the word. And now the word is holding him up. Did you get that? When you 
Align yourself to the spoken word of Christ. That word in and of itself carries everything that you need to walk it out. That word literally becomes the ability and power that begins to work through you. And so now we see Peter in the midst of his miracle. He's in the midst of his journey walking to Jesus. And what does he do? He takes his eyes off of Jesus, right? And he puts it where? On the surrounding storm. The surrounding storms of life. And what begins to happen? As he begins to put his focus on the storm, on the circumstance, all of a sudden now, the circumstance begins to influence the word that he heard. And all of a sudden, his trust begins to fail in the word of Christ. And now the influence of the storm, the influence of the, the circumstance begins to influence that word. And now his trust becomes divided. Oh, boy. What happens? He begins to sink. He's in the midst of his miracle. And when he allowed his trust to be divided, all of a sudden, what was an act, what was an act of faith and what was empowering him to be capable of doing, all of a sudden, that distrust in the voice began to dismantle the miracle he was walking in. Oh, man. You want me to start preaching again? <laughs> Liven you up a little bit? Some of us have heard God, but we're still allowing other voices to influence that word. And we're wondering why that word doesn't have as much power as we think it should. It's because we have divided trust. It's because we have, we have multiple voices speaking to that word. And that word will only produce through you to the degree you, you uh, behold that word. And to the degree you trust that word. And to the degree you align your life to that word. I don't know if we're getting this. Romans 10, 17, I said this yesterday. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So if faith comes by hearing, how do you think doubt comes? The voice of God would never lead you into a place of unbelief. So if you're in the process of your miracle and somewhere along the way you begin to doubt, listen, you're hearing from a different voice. It doesn't matter the circumstance coming against you. It just matters the word that you have. And you need to allow that word to prophesy to your circumstance, not that circumstance prophesy to your word. Hebrews chapter 12 says what? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What your eyes are fixed on determines if your faith is perverted or perfected. Faith is a byproduct of diligently seeking Christ. Hebrews 11.8 or 6, I believe it is. It's impossible to please God with, apart from faith without faith. But then it goes on to say, he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, I don't believe that verse is talking about faith in and of itself. I think, it's a, I think it's addressing the issue that if you diligently seek me, I will reward you with faith. Whew, man. <sighs> Team, can you go ahead and come up? Would you all stand with me this morning? We have about five minutes here. Well, I feel like God wants to touch some of us. And, my, and what I want to say to you right now 
is if you've been hearing this message this morning and you've been being stirred in your heart to dream again, I just want you all to come up here. You don't have to get in front of these people. I just want you to come up here to the altar. And I'm going to ask my team to go around and begin to lay hands on you, okay? Because God wants to restore dreaming with him again today. God wants to restore the childlikeness in our journey with him so that our life with him can become exciting again. Would you like that? As the worship team begins to play, I'm just going to do, begin to do a corporate prayer over you. And team, as I begin to pray, I just want you to begin to go throughout the crowd and just bless people. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you for convicting our hearts this morning. I thank you for challenging us right now to, to pursue you in a greater way, to pursue you as a child, to go after you with all that we are. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now in a greater way than what you're already here. We invite you to begin to destroy the, the barriers that we have in our minds, destroy the barriers that we have in our heart as it pertains to following you. And God, we say, make us like a child again. Make us like a child again, Father. Make us like a child again, Father. I just want you on your own right now. Just begin to pray unto the Lord. Just begin to cry out to Jesus and say, Holy Spirit, touch me greater. Just begin to cry out to him. He's worthy of your attention. He's worthy of you diligently seeking him. Just lift your voices to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lift your voices to the, the apple of your eye. In his name's Jesus. Holy Spirit, I bless what you're doing right now. Holy Spirit, I bless what you're doing right now. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. We want to be like a child before you right now. Increase. Increase. Increase right now. Increase right now. More. More. Increase. Just begin to pray in your prayer language right now. Just begin to pray in your prayer language right now. You don't know what to say. God knows. Just begin to cry out to Him. More. There it is. More. I see Him coming right now. He's going deeper right now. Increase. 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 He's going deeper. More. More. We're here for you, God. We come before you as a child right now. We say, mold us, shake us, shape us, God. Challenge us to grow. We put our cakes back on again. We put our cakes back on again. And we say, we'll soar with you, Jesus. Father God, I just thank you for this time, this moment that we're in right now. Listen, I wish we had more time right now to just really press in and go after this. But we have another group of people that are waiting eagerly to come in. So Lord, I just bless right now every person in this room. I bless what you're doing, Lord. And my encouragement to all of you is right, it's right here. You leave from here wearing your cape. Wearing that cape when you were a child, that Superman cape, that Wonder Woman cape, and know 
You're a child of God. I bless you all, and thank you for hearing, listening to me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.